Hello, Chris. Data hey, modeling. Fine, fine. And you? I always forgot to ask you that. Sorry. I'm really... doing great. Yeah. I got coffee. Watch oh. me run, right? I, I got tea. Um, so you did a talk recently at, um, I yeah, cannot pronounce KCDC. that, KCDC, which is the... Kansas City Developer Conference. Oh. Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. Oh, Not there's more Kansas than one City. Kansas City. Well, Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri are the two halves of the same actual city. But legally, they're in different states, and there's a river in the middle, and... Okay. There's one giant metropolitan area with two cities in it. Okay, that's um, uh, okay. I learned something. It's like you know when mm. we talk about Brussels, you have yeah. Brussels, uh, which is part of Brussels region, yeah. which is part of Brussels, which is yet another something. So it's right, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's and and you have a Brussels in the states as well, more than one, yeah. I think. Okay, <laughs> that's not on the topic we have at hand. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about, oh maybe uh, on the data modeling, <laughs> naming yeah. things. So, um, yeah, so Kansas City doesn't, uh, KCDC doesn't do recordings. Mm -hmm. So I want to, you know, get a chance here to share this out in a format where more people can see what we talked about. Uh, because I got a lot of interest in this particular talk. And, um, you know, they're all, all talks are ongoing, evolving things. But I think this one is uh, pretty good. So. Okay. Um, all right. So what, what's our goal here, right? So I'm going to do a little bit of background about what's going on, and then I'm going to dive into uh, the data modeling itself, right? Yep. So simple, scalable apps. That's what we want. That's what we all want. <laughs> we don't want to be like killing ourselves. But why we start killing ourselves, what the, the root mechanism of that problem is, isn't always clear, right? And this will become... Why is this important? We can a little bit very clear later. But so let's talk about what the enemy is that prevents simple applications, right? We got a UI, you got a single page web app, doesn't have any data sources, static content, simplest thing in the world, right? Yep. Well, now we give it a back end, right? And I can update and I can retrieve it. So I've got two links I've got to worry about, right? I can read data, I can request this and get it back. Bang, bang, right? Yep. But now I want to be able to still read and request data, but now I want to be able to write a command and I want to know whether or not my command worked. And now those two systems in the back end need to update themselves, right? So maybe I can make it all one thing here, but you know, you know we're talking about complexity, but it's what happens when we add another piece to this, Yep. right? And what's really important here is that this was one, this is two, this is six. Uh, six things, yes. This is the six things you, at the very least, even if you don't have to write them, you have to consider whenever you touch any one of these components, right? It's, it's your mental load, the places where defects can show up. And now instead of having a simple read model, if I have a cache and a backing store, and I have an update. So maybe I write a command and it has to update the backing store and update the cache. And I have to keep the cache current with the backing store, right? All of a sudden now we've jumped from six to 24 possible ways things can upset. This is why, you know, people like layering, right? Because we're doing clearly bad things here, right? Mm -hmm. We're letting UI talk to the database, right? Um, but now, what if I have multiple backend data sources, right? We've just jumped from 24 to 120. No. I forget what the number is. Lots. <laughs> that? Yeah. Lots. Um, so, yeah. So, but it's a factorial. Yeah. It's a simple factorial. That's the progression. Um, it gets a lot com more complicated very, very quickly. And so that's how you get this, right? That's a, that same simple progression of having different teams not worried about 
isolation and what's connected to what and what can possibly impact what, mm -hmm. right? Not what is deliberately calling it, but what could affect it, right? If we don't think about these as direct connections, but we think about as possible impacts, that's what these really represent. It's so what do you have to keep in your mind in order to safely make a change in any one of these? Yep. May right? I, that's what... Yep. Sorry. Okay. Um, may, may I maybe make one comment on the preceding slide because this one is there's too much? Sure. Uh, is that, okay, th those are maybe direct connections. So something talking directly to something which has all sorts of yeah. runtime issues, but so putting something in the middle like, one gigantic message system is not going to help because it's like indirect. A hmm? So that's what that's what this is. This is a database. Oh, oh right. my God! Uh, no, this is a this is a Redgate dependency diagram on a database, which was the one thing in the middle to keep the system simple. And when we drill into that little tiny thing, that's the policy table. Um, and the ring around it, you can sort of see. You've worked on that? Yes. Oh, my. And, and that ring around this is the stored procedures that are used to isolate and protect access to the uh, policy table. Okay. I'm not going to mention where this came from. I don't want to know. <laughs> but the red lines are things that impact policy, and the gray lines are things that read from policy. Okay, that's uh, <clears throat> that's scary. <laughs> right. You can't, you know, you know, no, you can't tell me anybody understands what's going to happen when you make a change here, right? Yeah, you just don't know, right? You do not know what's going to happen when you make a change. This is what complexity does, and you know what? We can do it in the cloud too, <laughs> <laughs> right? Microservices, yeah, yep. right. Now there's probably a more, a more uh, actual logical structure underneath this, but if you have to worry about the impacts or if your business to send a report to the business is the current state of all of this, how do you do that? Right? You can't. <laughs> you so, send a drawing. <laughs> so tongue in cheek a little bit, but really question came up on, on Twitter. Like if there was one thing you could share with everybody you know, your law, so to speak, this would be it. Any system with five or more interconnected degrees of freedom is incomprehensible. You cannot understand what's going to happen here because the changes echo, right? You, you just don't know what happened. So the corollary is systems can be rendered comprehensible by reducing the allowed permutations, mm -hmm. right? And three-layered architecture. Bang. All of a sudden, we're down to a much more understandable system. But each one of these internally can grow and become more complicated. Yep. So the minimal complexity is a line. Yep. If we say that each one of these components has an input queue and an output queue, and they're going to talk in a, in a linear fashion, that is the simplest possible structure we can use. And you can do this fractally inside each component. But this is the heart of CQRS. Yep. What it's saying is I'm going to make commands come down the right side. They go to a business logic set of microservices. They write to a store. Then we create a read store. We have a read side business cache, goes back up to the app. Yep. You can simplify this down. I'm just trying to show if you, if you had five components, this is the simplest diagram, right? And what those pipelines allow us to do, because that's what we've built. We've turned the entire app into series pipelines. Now we can scale them out. And because each one of those components, right, still just has in and out, and they're not affecting each other, they don't increase the complexity. Yep. So there it is in a nutshell. This is what we're trying to do. This is why we're moving from that relational database to events. This is the goal 
this is what we're trying to get to is this simplicity of data flow, right? How do we want to do that? Let's talk about our storage engine, right? Because the real focus is on that problem up there with that over complexity in storage, because storage tends to be a coupling element, mm -hmm. right? We have relational, we've got graph, we've got document. There's another one that we forget about all the time, ordered. We all use this, we've used this forever. We haven't turned it into a proper database. Well, we have, Event Store has, but ordered storage is a persistence mechanism where data is appended in the order it's received into an immutable log, right? This is really old. It has only recently come back on the scene as a true data storage mechanism. <clears throat> the log, we use it all the time, unstructured yep. data, boom. The ledger, everything's a transaction, blockchain, right? Yep. Um, event streams. Generally, this is an example of an external event. It's a stream of facts that have occurred. So each of these are refining things more in terms of what do we mean in terms of ordered storage, right? So now, how do we use that in an app? You know, and this is important to understand what we're modeling and what we're dealing with, right? We've got command sourcing, change logging, state logging, and event sourcing. This, this is a Turing machine. This is a physical Turing machine. I love it. I, I think it's amazing somebody actually built it because all everything we do in computer science is little Turing machines that we write and we run, right? And so here's our Turing machine, right? We've got a log, we got a tape, we got the machine with some state, something comes into the machine, produces an output, and then we are gonna save our state here, right? Yep. Um, and this is, what we're gonna, this is how we're gonna know how to change that input into an output. If we save the input, we're command sourcing. There's times where this is awesome. If we save the internal state, we're either doing a delta. One of the things I like to think about is you're a warehouse, and a box comes into the warehouse, right? Right. If you're saving um, the commands, you're saving, please add a box. If you're saving inventory increased by one, that's change logging. If you're saying inventory is now 80, that's state logging, right? If you save box added, now that's event source. Yep. Right? So, the problem with command logging and the problem with state logging is you're still coupled to the instance, the particular version of your service, right? If I have box added, you know, please add a box to warehouse. What if the warehouse is full? Yep. How do we know if the warehouse saved the box? We don't. We don't know if the warehouse opens the box it doesn't save the box, it saves the components. We don't know what, what we do with that request without having that machine, yep. right? You know, if inventory increases by one, we don't know if that was because a box was added because someone did inventory and they found a new box, right? We don't know if someone decided, well, no, <clears throat> we don't want to do it by box, we want to do it by gross. And that box is too gross in it. So therefore it's now two, right? We don't know why. Same thing with inventory equals 80. We don't know why it equals 80 without knowing that machine. Box added, anybody can read that log and they know what happened. That's important because people forget that the machine is not just some other machine, some other service, but it's also the next version of the same one you've got. Yep. Right. So I can't upgrade. I can't run multiple versions of the same service. I can't add a new service without fully understanding everything the last service did. Where if I externalize it into business facts and the law, anybody can understand what happened. Yep. So that's event sourcing. That's what we're going to model here. Okay. So that's what we're trying to model. Oh, there we go. 
I had a slide to cover all of that. So applications decisions in our precision mutable sequence of business events. What did the business decide? What happened? Account was opened, um, a credit card locked, package added, shopping cart modified, right? Yep. What happened? Stream inventory database, corrected. Right, inventory corrected. So a stream database takes a log, divides it into streams, right? And then we also have projections. So that's how we build event source applications using these fine-grained streams. And this is what we're going to get into here. So you're, you're looking for, this is a quick checklist of what you want in that storage. We also are going to have what we call stream categories. Categories are similar to tables we're going to see later. So we have the log, we have a category foo, category bar, and then instances, which are roughly equivalent to rows are inside that. And so you'll see that there is a global order of all the events, an order inside the category or table, and a, and a order inside the instance or row. Yep. Okay. So now let's go all the way back. So we're going to go all the way back to, to, to COD in the definition of the relational model, right? What he said is that we're going to take data and we're going to create tuples. And I'm talking about the old definition of tuples, the original one in the paper, where a tuple is a series of related items together. And what they found to be very useful to do with the tuples was to group the tuples by schema. And tuples group by schema, they called a table. So our events, if we take all of the first level properties on the event, that event forms a tuple. So that's what we're gonna map an event to. An event can be seen as equivalent to the schema that you would see in a table. Yep. All right. Now we're not going to say all events go into the same streams though, right? Cause that's not as useful as what we wanna do. And then the other thing relational databases got really good at is they crawl, they join tables or tuple sets and they do set operations on them. So we're gonna take a slightly different focus and approach. So let's look at our standard third normal form. We've got customers, we have invoices, we have a payment status, we got line items. So what we need to do is we need to find what we're gonna call categories, okay? And we're gonna say that the root IDs in this here are really customers and invoices. So yep. those are our categories. And what we're gonna see as we do, then we find those categories. We got one table here, which is one schema definition. And we have another category here with three different schema definitions. Yep. So we're going to say that the tuple schemas that are allowed inside a category, a category defines a set of schemas that are allowed for data about a particular topic, you know, an entity or an aggregate, right? Yep. And that's going to be characterized by a primary key ID. In here, we can say we have two customers one and two, and we have two invoices, one and two. So what we're then gonna do is I'm going to create an instant stream for each primary key underneath the category. And now every operation that I do to these schemas, I'm gonna give a name to. So on schema, and a name, so a tuple with a schema and a name is an event, Yep. right? So here I've got an insert becomes add customer, right? And the schema is the name and the terms. An update term extension negotiated and the schema is 
just the terms. Yep. Right. So the set of schemas, the set of events that you can apply is limited to the category. And you model those the same way you would model a third normal form, you know, relational model. The difference is we've got a richer definition of what's happened because we're not throwing away information on changes. And we actually have this concept of a category that groups together related set of schemas around, um, you know, a category and aggregate. And then we're gonna have different, you know, tuple schemas that we can apply to that. But it still is strongly bounded. Yep. Right, and so add customer, we see the same schema here. With invoice, things get a little bit more interesting. I've add invoice, add line item. In relational, that would be a different table. Yep. Here, it's in the same instance stream inside the category. And so I've got a complete history of what's happened in that invoice, right? So that's how we go from this model where we can have this rich, strong data model for relational data and we turn it into an event model for stream data. Yep. Um, may I just have one comment on the next slide? Sure. Um, when you look at term extension negotiated, the operation on the database would probably be update uh, customer uh, with ID one, where ID uh, where ID is one, set uh, yeah. the term. So uh, you tonight, see here, right? To, right. So uh, the default terms in this are yeah. net thirty. Yeah. And, and see customer one has net ninety. Yeah. So I mean, let's say I want to change the ter the payment term for for uh, category uh, uh, blah, 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 uh, customer number one. I have right. an update. Update yeah. uh, net one twenty. Update customer where you know payment terms equals ninety. Where customer ID equals one. Which is basic. Which is invisible when the change happens. You see. Correct. Oh, it's now it's 120. If you look at the at the next slide, then you will right. have term extension negotiated in this case. Right. The thing is, and that's funny, if you look at the business code, people will have a button like re, um, term rego rego re Term uh, new 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 term, yeah. right. <laughs> um, and then they will have some some in the business layer code um, add new term or uh, change right. term or extension. And so the the what's happening on the on on when the code is expressive in terms of business is also appended into the output information. Yep. The expressiveness. I mean, when when it's yeah, expressive yeah. enough, we, we capture all the information. We capture what happened. It becomes clear in the log. This is why I went through the log and everything. So the log is a clear record of everything that occurred. Yep. Right. So we know we added a customer. We know we extended the terms. Right. We know when any other information we need to know about that term extension, we know. Right. Um, here, you know, invoice two, right? So oh, I've got better. add invoice. Add line item four. So if we go up here, you know, I look at invoice two services, there's one line item. Yep. But down here, we see that actually there were two line items and then one of them was removed. Yep. Right. So that is, and we, we have the full details of what it was before. So if we wanted to re add it, if we want to go, well, why did they not buy it? We know what happened. So there's a history here. So at, you know, at customer, we know what the original terms were. We know what the new terms were. You know, we, we have more detail, more richness of what we can know about the business and what we can formally model. Because in the formally modeling this data is really important when it comes to our downstream data lakes, right? When we want to know what's happened, we want to run analytics. We want to have a consistent view. We don't want this to be the Wild West. We want formally well-crafted, defined schemas that we can hand to the data teams and go, okay, when you look at this, here's what it means, yep. right? So that also gives us our, our sort of first order 
read model on the category, which is a category can be seen as the data union on, of all of the fields on all of the event schemas that are allowed in the category, right? And generally it's assumed, and it's a good practice, that any field on any event in a category with the same name means the same thing inside yeah. the boundary of the category, right? And you'll notice this looks exactly like a sparse column or store, yep. right? So that's the model that we've got here, right? Is we can see that these various schemas create a union, which is the schema for the category. And then each one of the events is a change to that overall schema. This yep. effectively forms a document, yep. right? So the current state is effectively, if we had a key value on that, and we had a document, that document would be the union of the changes over time, but we still have the history. Yep. So this can be looked as a document. This can be viewed as a first normal form report table, right? So we're building back into all of these other models from this fundamental lossless approach with the full schema in the de defining properties and the richness of modeling from relational plus additional concepts because our changes to the model are recorded with names, our history is retained, and we have a new concept of a category that allows us to express more things in our formal model. So the richness of how you can model with this new approach is much deeper than it is with any one of these things individually. And then you can transform that into the state in these other systems, right? And if you go check out the talk on, you know, distributed or quantum consistency, you know, you can see how these distributed models can become very powerful and easily synced because the same transaction guarantees that we want yep. in other places. So best practices for data that you're writing to your primary store, keep it sparse, keep it sparse. Third normal form, changes only, don't repeat yourself. No flag fields, no nullable fields. Flag fields and nullable fields are a sign that you really want two events Two different schemas. Yep. All right. Flag field, you mean something like uh, uh, booleans and. Yeah, a flag or, you know, like, you know, update type. Oh, you yeah. Know, oh. Update inventory, update type with an enumeration. Yeah, okay. No, that's four different updates. Just define them all in the schema. Yep. Right. You're folding things in because, because in a relational model, we're used to having to fold you know, concepts from the code yep. into the table, don't fold them, just do a direct map. Yep. So your code and the events and the storage will all align. And even if it's a little bit more wordy, that alignment as things at large is going to be hugely beneficial in keeping things simple, Yep. right? Um, model your process history, model things as they happen. Current state is a fold or is derived from that history. Think about that column or store. Yep. Current yep. state is, what are the current values of all these fields? Application enforced surrogate key relationships. What that means is up here, if we take a look at um, remove line item, right? I said just remove line item five, mm -hmm. right? Or um, add invoice, if we take a look here, client ID is the second is the second field in that schema. So I am adding an invoice for that client. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, I may have screwed that up here, but the idea is that the invoice should reference the customer by ID, and that's enforced in the app, not enforced in the 
in the schema. It allows you a lot of flexibility that relational models that require all the keys to match really put a lot of tension on, and it's not required in this model. Yep. Um, no display data. Very often I'll see people go, well, I'm gonna add an invoice. It's for Bob Jones. I need to display Bob Jones. Why don't I put his name in my event? So when I see the invoice added event, I can display his name, right? Well, what if Bob Jones is a DBA, right? What if, you, you know, the thing is you, you do want a third normal form sensibility. That means no duplicate data. The data is someplace else, use a reference key. Yep. Your application can cache all the customers. So you know a really nice fast lookup. Oh, you added customer one? I know what customer one's name is. And if it changes, you'll get an update. Yep. That's how you want to do it. That's how this can be a durable long-term store of the state of your source data. Now, when you're publishing out, um, and I think I've got a slide on this um here when you're publishing out then you don't want to publish out you know customer one added terms change you want to publish out invoice complete with all the details yeah uh, as a full a document. nice public Self, self-contained document self nobody comes back and asks you for details so that's data on the inside data on the outside right Additional design concerns, data retention, plan out your data retention. Oscar's got a great article on it. Um, definitely look at closing the books. That's where you formally roll your storage, yep. you know, on a yearly basis or whatever period makes sense for you. Think about your estimated stream length. If you're gonna, if you're worried about what, how do I replay millions of events? Your streams are too long, right? Look at your model, divide things up, you want nice fine grain streams, right? You want to think of streams as rows and not as tables. Streams should be short, fast to recover. That's what you're going to lock on at the end of the day. Keep it small. Yep. Um, personally identifiable information, GDPR, model it separately. From the get go, you know, you want to have customer 9952. And you want to have a separate place where you store. That's Mike Smith. He lives at one, you know, Main Street in Agua, Mass. 01001, right? Agua, Mass. Jesus happens to be the first zip code in the U.S. Okay. Right. Um, so one Main Street in the first zip code. You know, that's my go-to on random made-up <laughs> addresses. There is there isn't actually a one main street by the way. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> the horror stories about fake addresses. Right. Um, I think Main Street starts at like three or five or something. Um, so model it separately so that your system can keep on working with customer five nine two three and not know its name. But all of your data needs to still be there. You still sold the product. You still have to track what happened. I might not know who I sold it to. That's fine. Separate it out. That goes for any information store. It has nothing to do with event modeling. That's just, you've got to do it. Yeah, yeah um, I, I, I'd even say that that list and the one you didn't talk about applies to any good data modeling, whatever store you're using or for any right. systems. Right. So one of the things we're talking about here is creating a global ordering on the log. So we have to think about the scope in which that applies. Yeah. Right. So what that means is I might want to have, if I've got a banking system, I've got banks in New York, South Africa, Hong Kong, probably going to have one log for each bank. Right. Or, and that could be anything I'm doing. You've got to determine which sets of things in your business need common ordering and which ones don't. Yep. Right. And any one of your microservices, because a stream database is naturally segregated, it can service multiple categories of microservice and provide a global ordering or a common context between them. Yep. 
So you just need to figure out which ones go together, need the ordering. Like I might do the shopping carts, the warehouse, the payment gateway on one system because they're all going to care about orders placed, inventory levels, and payment status, right? Yep. Um, and then public private schema internally for your source of truth, just like any relational store, private schema. Your public schema is different. Even if version one matches one-to-one, -one, set them up because you're gonna to wanna to be able to change your private schema. And once you've published it, you break all of your downstream consumers every time you make a change. Yep. Keep your private data tight, small, fine-grained, private, and your public schema is coarse-grained, no callbacks, full sets of data to be consumed. Yep. And that's the real difference between third normal form, first normal form in usage. Private APIs, public APIs, you see the same pattern everywhere. It's all talking about the same thing. So what we're gonna see here is these little cans. This is the uh, hexagonal, you know, hexagonal, hexagonal architecture, um, you know, to represent an application with a series of writers and a series of processors and event store and an anti-corruption layer that transforms my private schema here to a public schema and then publishes it either Kinesis, um, Azure, Event Bus, you know, Kafka, whatever, right? So you're participating in a wider organization, but your app should have one private store for its app state. That's that. Questions? I don't really ask you a whole room, but I'll just ask you, I guess. <laughs> no, 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 that was that was pretty clear. And uh, yeah, no, I, I want to insist, just insist again that uh, all the practices of, you know, separating data on inside, outside, have your yeah. private information or personal information separated, segregated from the rest and so on. That's uh, advice that is, uh, important for any any type of uh, modeling, yeah. data modeling. So we're not doing something, it's not really different. No. There's nothing new. That, 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 that would be my new, question. There's nothing that's new. That's the real thing I want people to take away from this is all the modeling tools, everything we learned about data modeling is still there and you get more. Yeah. Far too often I've seen these cowboys, you know, this cowboy tension where developers and microservices are, they're moving fast, they're breaking things, they're creating schemas, they're changing things. And this all comes together, you know, in this toxic data lake where you've done change in a capture, you've done this. And sure, if you're doing change to capture from one point to another, it works. But when I've got three teams, five teams, 10 teams, or 10, or 10 services and three teams, and they're all changing, and one consuming group is trying to put together a view of the enterprise for that, mm -hmm. right? That's gonna be insane. Yeah, really? I have utmost respect for people who are doing data science and so on for to be able to cope with such a high level of changes and- um... Well, and it's not even that. I mean, how many, I've seen people who are trying to rebuild ERPs, oh. right? Just to understand the state of you know, if you've got a microservice managing your contractors and a microservice invoice state and approvals, right? How do I know if I can invoice somebody for this contractor's work if it hasn't been approved and they're all separate microservices? How do I bring that all together just to do a simple business process, right? I need some sort of organization to get this all going together. And I don't want to lose everything I got there are benefits from Microsoft I want to keep, yep. right? So we don't even have to go all the way to the data lake. We can just say integrated business process. How do I know what's, where things are at? Yep. Timeline, ordered sequence. Timeline right. is probably not the correct, but that order sequence is, is um, uh, and, and, and fine green events are the 
key to it. Okay, that Great. was cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, uh, Chris, and see you next time. All right, bye. Bye.